Well, good morning. Um, the very impromptu ad for this morning, while I was ironing my shirt this morning, I think, where's he going with this? Um, I was nearly brought to tears. And the reason was, I was playing uh, some music on my phone, and it was a playlist I had from uh, a few months ago. And it was Teze, as you do, in, while you're ironing. And then it clicked into uh, another song. And it's actually a song we're going to sing at the end of this service. But it was an instrumental. Is here. The Spirit is with us. Because when we give our lives to the Lord, the Spirit comes into us too. And so we all carry the Spirit. We are all temples of the Holy Spirit. And so when we gather, we're bringing the Spirit with us. And that most ancient of prayers, Vini Sancte Spiritus, come Holy Spirit, doesn't mean you weren't here and now you're here. It means come and move amongst us. We want more of what you have to give us. So, here's a question. Oh, I've got a little gadget here. Let's see if this works. Whee! Okay, so if I were to ask you the question, what is spirit-filled worship? What does it look like? Is it that picture at the top? Inevitably, hands will be in the air. The lights may well be down, and you'll have lots of colored spots. Are you with me? Yeah? Guitar? Yeah? Guitars? Drum singers? All sorts of very loud instruments? Repeating songs over and over and over and over again. <laughs> Although I did mention Teze earlier, which is exactly what it is. Um, is that what spirit-filled worship is? Or is it the one on the right? That comes from the Toronto Blessing. You may not be able to see it very well, but there's a load of people lying on the floor laughing. Is it only spirit-filled if people are shouting out and, and singing in tongues and lying on the floor, slain in the spirit? Is that spirit-filled worship? And when I Googled it, it came up with this, spirit-filled worship. You've got the picture of the, the dove, the picture of the Holy Spirit. People inevitably hold their hands up. And it says 1 Corinthians 11 to 14. 1 Corinthians 11, we did a series on this a couple of years ago. You may remember, 1 Corinthians 11 is about sharing the Lord's Supper. And Paul really rebuking them because they had those who ate first and the others who sat outside and got nothing. Because worship is about community. 1 Corinthians 12, about the body of Christ and having a whole range of different gifts which we share to build up the church. 1 Corinthians 13, do it in love or don't do it at all. You know, clanging gongs and cymbals and all that stuff. 1 Corinthians 14, and your worship should be orderly. That is spirit-filled worship. Here's a picture. If you haven't seen it, either come to the 11.30 when we're going to show the video, or look it up on YouTube. It is a video which came out about a week ago. It is a whole series of Ukrainian Christians reading Psalm 31. And this is a picture of a family. It's a mum and two teenage sons, I think. And they're reading those words from Psalm 31 in a bunker. There's another picture, um, which I've got on the next slide, where there's a little boy, and he's in the dark. He can only see the words because somebody's shining the light of their phone on their Bible, on his Bible, because he's in a bomb shelter. So no lights, no comfy chairs, no guitars. All they have is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. I put it to you, my lord, that that is spirit-filled worship. 
So here's some words from Psalm 31. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. As for me, I trust in the Lord. What are our worthless idols? Simon Ponsby, when talking about worship in the Spirit, says this, without the work of the Spirit, our worship and prayer would be idolatrous. So we did a recent survey, which is, what do you think about the services? What works for you, what doesn't work for you? All of which, perfectly legitimate, But wouldn't it have been great if we'd got 41 answers which said anything led by the Spirit? There's nothing wrong with having preferences. But the centre of what we do, the centre of our worship, needs to be led by the Spirit to lead us into praise and worship of Father God who gives us the Spirit in the first place. So let's have a look at our reading. You won't be able to read that. That was more to remind me. Um, If you can read up there, it's great. So the first thing that Jesus says in this this, um, encounter, which is in the upper room, it is uh, the night before Jesus died, and he is telling the disciples, who are basically, by chapter 16, they are clueless. They've got no idea what Jesus is going on about. They don't recognize that he's going to die. They don't recognize he's going to be raised again, or anything that's happened in the last three years. They're just going, what is he talking about? And so Jesus concludes this uh, before going on to pray in chapter 17 by encouraging them by the fact that he's going to send the Spirit. And the Greek word is parakletos, which is helper, advocate. In the uh, translation we had there, it was comforter. But it literally means one who comes alongside. So Spirit-filled worship is worship where you have God alongside you as you are worshipping. The other word is pneuma tessalathus, which is spirit of truth. And, and Jesus repeats this, that the spirit brings truth. And the opposite of truth is? Lies. So the spirit of truth. He goes on to say, he will testify about me, but then gives the challenge, and you must testify about me too building up to that, Matthew 28, you know, make disciples and teach them to do all that I commanded. The Spirit points to Jesus. And he goes on to say, this is all so that you will not fall away. It's ever so easy to fall away, isn't it? Particularly over the last two years. And that which will bring you back, he who will bring you back is the Spirit of God himself. If that's you, come for prayer at the end. Goes on to say, some will seek to kill you and see it as a service of God. Persecution. There comes a time when the truth is not what people want to hear, is not what people believe. If we're not offending people, the chances are we're not speaking the gospel. Let's say that again. If we're not offending people, I don't mean go out to offend people, but if we speak the truth and people get upset about it, there's a good chance that that is spirit-filled worship. There are boundaries to that, obviously. Jesus says, it's good that I go away. They spent three years with him. They love him. This is terrible news that Jesus is going to go away. But he says, I have to go away so that I can send you this spirit of truth. Because the spirit of truth will prove sin, righteousness, and judgment. It will show you the truth of the things that take you away from God. It will show you what being right with God looks like. And you will know that there is a judgment. And if you don't know there's a judgment, why worry about whether you're sinning or not? 
But if the Spirit convicts us of judgment, the Spirit also convicts us of the sins which take us away and will take us into judgment. We will all be judged. Many will get through, but many won't. So the Spirit's job is to convict us of that. He will guide you in all truth. In other words, he will help you to avoid error and he will help you to avoid lies. Because the lies of the enemy are incredibly seductive. And he closes that section by saying, the Spirit receives it from the Father and gives it to you to glorify the Son. So when you hear from the Spirit, then that is God speaking directly to you, and in doing so, in receiving that, you glorify Jesus. And that is the definition of worship, isn't it? Glorifying Jesus. Yes? Oh, you're going, oh, it's a little bit heavy. Oh, I don't know about this. In John 4.24, it says, God is spirit. True worshippers worship in spirit and in truth. Now, you probably know that phrase. The context is that Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman on a mountain. And the Samaritans thought that worship took place on their mountain, but the Jews believed that the worship took place in Jerusalem on another mountain. And Jesus says, it's neither. The time will come when you will worship in spirit, in truth, wherever you are. And that includes in a bunker in the middle of a wall. And so, whatever our preference is, that's fine. But we don't make that the determination of whether worship is possible or worship is taking place. The only thing that leads to worship is the Holy Spirit himself. So, it says on my thing here, slide, so we need the next one. So let's think about how this might apply. The first place in which this might apply is, I don't know what your morning was like, but you got here. Now for some, you got here because you always come on a Sunday and it was just your normal routine. For others, you may have had that I really can't face it today. And if that was you, come back for prayer at the end. Um, And it's the Spirit who will bring you. So the Spirit's workings in us are even before we gather. And then we do gather, and then we confess. And as we just said, through Jesus' own words, that the Spirit points to sin and convicts us of our sin. If we want to know if something is sinful... Ask the Holy Spirit and he will tell you. He will tell you in your own spirit, in your own soul, as to whether that is something which is going against God. He can't do anything else. And I love this picture of the, 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 the little child reading the Bible in the bed. I think that's great. We believe that the Bible is inspired by the Spirit through human hand. And we interpret what it means by the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is right in the middle of the Bible reading we had earlier and how you heard it. And if you want to hear God's word through God's word, we need to be open to the Holy Spirit. And the same for the sermon. Pray for me that what you hear from me are God's words and not mine. Don't sit there and go, okay, I'll tell you if it was any good. And don't, while I said to the nine o'clock, is don't say to me on the way out, that was a good sermon. Say, that inspired me. I heard from God today. Or, I didn't inspire, I didn't hear from God today. But not, don't mark it. That's not the point. I sung worship. Sing in the spirit. Connect our souls to our creator through our sun worship. Don't mark them. Don't say, well, the band was really good today. Well, it's quite nice to say that as well. But I hope you know what I'm saying. That is not the marker of true worship because true worship is in spirit and truth. So the next thing is our prayers of intercession. 
our leaders of intercession are leading all of us, as Simon was telling us last week, in that standing between. It's what it means, standing between somebody else that we're praying for and God. And it's the Spirit who leads us in those prayers. And the Spirit can work in the writing of the prayers before the sermon, or before the service, as much as in the service. So he's, he's in all of it. And then communion. Grant that by your Spirit these gifts may be to us, we say, in the prayer. And so what is bread and what is wine? Just creatures, it's just things. God turns into grace by the work of his Holy Spirit. So even through communion, the Spirit is working. And without the work of the Holy Spirit, our worship and prayer are idolatrous. We need to think about these things. And then I thought about, well, what about other services? Baptism. What makes baptism special? Is it the water? No, because it came out of the tap. There's nothing special about the water, and there's definitely nothing special about the priest. It is the Holy Spirit working through that makes that a sacrament, a visible, uh, sorry, a, yeah, a visible sign of an invisible grace. The Holy Spirit's invisible grace, a visible sign is the water. What about a wedding? We hold a wedding in the presence of God. Well, what is that presence of God with the couple on that day? It is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we pray the Holy Spirit over them that they will know that Holy Spirit for the rest of their married lives. And they will know sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then we have a closing prayer. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. So is spirit-filled worship only on a Sunday and only in this place? Well, hopefully the conclusion is no. So here's some interesting ideas. Send us out. We have a PCC on Monday night. Can the PCC, even though it's business, be worship? in spirit and in truth? Ask another question. If it's not, why not? There you go. If that doesn't encourage anybody to come on PCC, I don't know what will. <laughs> but it is. It should be for your glory, Lord. You know, and we pray. Give us the wisdom to make your decisions in these things. And I think is actually not the right start to a sentence when you're on PCC. We all do. But let's see what the Spirit lays on our hearts. I know of a church who actually their, their governance is, they have a, a congregation gathering, and they'll say they'll only make a decision when everybody agrees. It's terribly un-Anglican. <laughs> <laughs> and they both say, well, how do you ever make a decision? Well, we just wait. Because the Spirit, in any decision will convict everyone when it's the right time. And if there's dissent before that, then it's not the right time. And it works for them. I'd love to try it. (laughs) The coffee bar, going to say a bit more about that later, when that opens up a bit more. Is that a place of worship? It should be. Carousels, wonderful stuff going on with the uh, mums and carers and, and, and little ones. Place of worship. We're looking for spirit filled worship pleasing to God. And if anything I've said today is helpful to us as a church, we will go from this place with a much broader and wider understanding of what worship is and a much narrower understanding of what spirit-filled worship is. Don't let's worry about the lights, whether they're up or down. Don't let's worry about the temperature or how comfortable the chairs are, or whether we chose the right songs, or whether 
the preacher came up with lots of funny stories. Let's make sure that our worship comes from him and goes back to the Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son and thank you that as he went away, he sent your Spirit. Help us to refocus all that we do in worship on you, that we can not feel guilty about what we might feel or think, but that we can feel joy in the worship which is Spirit-centered and Spirit-led. We ask for more of that, Lord, that we are a Spirit-filled and Spirit-led church. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.